there you are. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I just, I guess we wanted to say thanks for everyone of, you know, being online today and especially to the Unicorn Foundation for pressing ahead, um, even though it's COVID. So we do really appreciate that. Um, just before we start, we live on rural broadband in the middle of the country comes Ian. Um, Hi guys. So if um, our internet plays up, we do apologise for that. Just maybe post some comments and let us know. So I'm Jo um, and this is my unicorn Ian. So um, he's brave enough to um, race some fast cars, but he's not brave enough to speak in public, but he is happy to answer any questions that you might have at the end. So we've been asked today just to speak a little bit about our net journey. And um, I'm sure there's pretty, plenty of parts in our story um, that you'll be able to relate to um, along the way. But we'll just start off by saying we knew nothing about neuroendocrine cancer until just um, over a year ago. We'd actually never heard of it. Um, but boy, for us, things were, you know, really about to change. So Ian's a painter by trade and I work in insurance and together we've got five um, teenage kids I know probably a little bit crazy and um, we've got four boys and one girl um, but we're a very um, close-knit family um, we're very focused on the kids and there's often you know not a lot of time for ourselves so I guess it kind of started Ian would get sick and he would vomit for about I don't know, 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours, and he'd had a, have a big sleep and come right. And he'd had a tummy bug, um, really bad tummy bug as a kid, and he always thought it was this tummy bug kind of repeating on him. But the incident started to get more frequent, and it sort of went from every few years to kind of every year. And I would always get blamed of food poisoning him, of course, but it didn't make any sense because nobody else was getting sick. And um, honestly, I don't really think my cooking's quite that bad. So Ian would um, mention this to the doctors when he would go, you know, that he was having a vomiting bug. But you generally, you don't go to the doctors when you're vomiting. So by the time he would go, he was generally quite well and wouldn't come home with anything, you know, any tests or anything. Um, but then the vomiting started to get more frequent. And by the time it got to sort of, you know, almost maybe eight months apart, um, you know, we started to think things weren't quite right. And we worried about his lungs because obviously he'd been a, a painter with all those toxic fumes. So he got sent to the doctor with strict instructions. You need to come back with some, some tests to get something done. And I know he was feeling quite nervous um, about asking for those tests because he knew something wasn't quite right. And I guess it's, you know, do you, um, do you want to find out what that was? But he did come home with a X-ray referral form. And later on that day, we pushed him on his way and off he went to that doctor. And to get that X-ray, and he could tell by the look on the radiographer's face that something was horribly wrong. Um, she was actually a friend and I think she, she did her best to hide it. But basically um, after that, the GP got the results and uh, by eight o'clock the next morning, um, Ian was admitted into hospital and had a more detailed scan. And um, that identified a 10 centimeter tumor which was engulfing his pancreas. Um, clearly, that's what um, our friend, the radiographer, could see. And this is kind of where the whirlwind started for us. And uh, I'm not too sure about your personal journeys, but once you hear that word cancer, you don't really take too much else in. So it took us a while for us to get our head around this journey. So at first, we didn't, uh, we didn't sleep a lot. We went into overdrive. Um, our mind kind of shot from one thing to another. We weren't really ready to share the news um, with others and we certainly didn't really know how to process it. So we wanted to know a little bit more before we sort of shared the news with the kids. 
because we knew that they would have questions that they wanted to ask us and we didn't necessarily know that we would have all those answers. And we also knew that they would look to us for strength and how we would deal with that situation. So at this stage, we, we just knew it was a, a tumor and it was rather large. Um, we sort of did a bit of Google and found out where our pancreas was um, and what it did, because um, we were quite probably naive to, to all of that. Um, and we nervously waited for these biopsy results. Um, so Ian, in his own unique way, would discharge himself every night to be home for the kids. And then he would return to the hospital the following morning so no one would notice him missing. And I think as Avril would test, he's not really one for following the rules. So um, those first few days, they seemed to go really slow, but they also went really fast. Um, we spent hours just discussing um, how good our life was, um, what matters most to us, we cried and we hugged and we laughed and then we cried some more. And I guess everything about what matters in life suddenly became really clear to us and it became really, really obvious. So it was devastating news and we were heartbroken, but also we strangely felt like it was a gift for us, like a penny had dropped, although maybe a, a bit, of, bit of sweet one, I guess. Um, but it reminded us um, what matters most. So as those days went on, we discovered, and we named him Timmy the Tumor, um, that he was a neuroendocrine cancer, and we started to absorb information. And at that point, we felt really well supported, thanks to the, the doctors and the nurses um, and the Unicorn Foundation. Um, in the middle of all this devastating news, we hung on to every bit of good news that we could get. Um, and, you know, we found out that Timmy was a neuroendocrine tumor. And, and for us, that was positive news. So um, going back, I guess we realized that we couldn't travel this road alone and talking about it between ourselves and being honest about how we were really feeling was helping us to process things in our own mind. And it was starting to become less scary. So at that point, we shared the news with our family um, and with our friends. And um, Ian's case was actually deemed urgent. And we sat on the edge of our seats last year, seeing if we would get, um, or he would get PRRT treatment in Melbourne. Melbourne, but obviously with COVID, that wasn't to be the case. But obviously, thanks to COVID as well, PRRT treatment was brought to Auckland. And being on that urgent list, um, which is kind of, I guess, a double-edged sword, but we tried to look at the, the positive side. Um, he received treatment earlier this year. So um, basically now we're going about um, changing our lives and we have a much clearer picture of what's important to us. Um, for Ian, obviously retirements come early um, and that's how we look at it. Um, we've recently actually just sold up and bought a place at Wangamata near the beach. So um, for us, that's about keeping life simple. Um, and we're, you know, forever grateful, I guess, that um, with, with treatments um, that, you know, hopefully Ian will be here around, you know, when all of our kids get married and our grandchildren get born and obviously hopefully in that order. And we, we plan to be walking down the, the beach at 80. So um, I guess we're also not head in the sand and we realise the enormity um, of the diagnosis, but things in anyone's life can change from, from good to bad or, or bad to good. And, you know, there's situations that you just can't control. Um, but what we've realised is we can control how we deal with them. So our response, um, that, that's up to us. And what we've decided is just to, you know, we're going to make the most of every day. So Ian's not really one to hold back, um, but more so ever, you know, than ever, you know, we'll jump in the water at the beach, um, sometimes in our underwear. Um, we'll order an extra dessert. Um, 
sugar-free because he's now diabetic. Um, but we try not to sweat um, all the small things that are, you know, outside of our control. Um, I guess we also remind ourselves that there's people way worse off than us. And we had a discussion the other day and we reminded ourselves that when people ask, you know, how's Ian or how are you, Ian, that they're actually, um, and that seems to happen every time you bump into someone, but we remind ourselves that people are doing that with, with you know, good intentions and, and best intentions. Uh, so what else? I guess we've we've had, you know, as a couple, you have to have really difficult conversations that you never think you're ever going to have or, or want to have. But having those conversa conversations and being really open and honest with each other has meant we're able to build like a level of trust and a support for each other. And we've found that that's really invaluable. Um, so is there anything you want to add, Ian? I, I guess if there's any takeaways or advice, it would be to share your thoughts and be open with each other, even if it makes you really vulnerable. Um, we've found that being, you know, rawly honest is essential and um, probably laughter is always the best medicine. So, yeah, I'm not too sure if I have anything else to share on our journey. I know it's been a probably a long day for everybody, but Ian, do you no, have not anything? Really. I mean, from my point of view, I mean, Joe's obviously the talker in our family and she does it really, really well. Um, I can relate to, I, I didn't catch the guy's name, the architect, and the amount of emotions that you go through and how they, you go through denial, you go, you know, you almost self-pity and then you go through this anger thing that you've sort of had this disease growing inside you um, and you don't know how to deal with it. And I must admit for me now, after a period of time, I've got my head around it. Um, I remember going to see Ben and saying, my Ben, no bullshit, you know, how bad am I? Am I fucked? And he said, look, sorry. And he said, you know, I hope we're going to have this conversation again in three, four, five years' time. And I said to him at the time, you know, it's not about the dying part. It's about the wanting to watch my son graduate as a lawyer, um, the other one as a builder, and make sure the other one doesn't go into prison. Um, that's my young one. Um, there's so much you want to do with your life. And all of a sudden it's like getting hit in the head with a bat you sort of it just comes out of nowhere um so my advice to anybody is obviously take the cancer diagnosis on board but then try to live your life um and for us as joe said we've sold up here um so we're in the throes of moving um we're lucky enough to have bought a, a place at the beach and hopefully we'll walk down it for many years to come but at the same time, you have to be realistic about it. You know, the reality of, of the whole thing is that's probably not going to happen in our case. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's certainly a journey. Um, personally, I'd like to thank you, Avril, and you, Ben, if you're listening. Obviously, Jenny um, and everybody else who administers treatment and stuff like that. Um, it's really nice to have a... A place to go to where you see a, a friendly face. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much that you don't know about, and you you know you you take it on board that people you hear every day people are diagnosed with cancer, but unless it actually happens to you personally, you don't really take a lot of notice. Um, for me now, you sort of like you're going to live every day. So for me, thank you very much for the support that I've had from the Uniform Foundation. And um, yeah, and your injections overall are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy yeah. to, to take any questions or anything yeah. like that. We might have a question coming through. I'm not sure. Is someone, Jennifer, saying hi, Ian and Joe? I'm not sure if that's just a friendly hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you later, Ian. <laughs> For all those kind words. <laughs> But thank you to the Unicorn Foundation from us.
Right. Well, thank you both for um, coming on and sharing your story. Um, Ian, I'm super impressed. You just step in there and say a little bit. Oh, <laughs> thing is not my thing. Um, thank you, Joe, for encouraging him. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, sharing another story and one obviously so different to Polisi's is, is yet again, it just shows how different everyone is and, and the journeys that everyone goes through. And yet how um, important they are to each person, each family, each, and how they affect every family is different as well. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, guys.